Well, I'm just going to kind of lead the way, yeah. but I'm not really going to do anything else. Um, the, the point of the walk is to discover a couple of spaces on the way for us to sort of think about the questions that Pam's written on the map. Yeah. All right, and they're all on the perspective of the green capital. Um, what you think of it, what you know about it, if you don't, what questions can you ask about it? Um, but the main ones, what's it like to live and work in the European green capital? How are spaces in the city used? And what do you think about when you see the two images at the top? Um, and how does that fit in with the route we're going to take today? Okay. Are you good to set us off on our Yeah, um, yeah. Um, who's, I mean, I'll take the group with one camera and then it's. Yeah, we'll just sort of follow along. We're following that man. Okay. Follow that man. Yeah. God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is quite Bristol, isn't it? That you've got an, it's really close to the city centre. You've got a community centre with a garden, um, beautiful kind of play areas and things like that. I don't know that you get that. Get that use of space in uh, in all sorts of different cities. Um, I know obviously you don't don't so much in London because everything's so expensive. Um, and I think I don't know. I suppose my knowledge of Birmingham is ten years old, so they might have changed the way they use space. But I feel this is quite unique. Right. So I'm going to do a bit of a voiceover here about the fact that this is so. Here is Trinity Police Station, and um, you struggle to think about what might be the connection between the police and the green capital, and yet they're a fundamental part of society. And yet I don't know that anybody's had any serious conversations with the police about the European green capital. Why do you always wear a badge? Yeah, are people right. proud to wear them? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people take them to give out to their team. Yeah. To show them. It's got some of the most amazing architecture in the whole city, hasn't it, Old Market? It's got these incredible old buildings that are from the Gin Palace to the arms houses yeah. Yeah. to the West Street. I mean, what is really fascinating in the arms houses? Yeah. It's kind of the threshold where the river goes under. Yes. Yeah. As well. It's, it's culverted, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can follow through the map. I know someone who's canoed it. Well, I know someone who knows someone who's canoed it. <laughs> Let's go here. It suddenly stops being really like craziness, which that centre is in the middle of a thoroughfare yes. of the old market. Yes. Yeah. 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 But it's kind of madness for cars. Yes. Um, so, you know, when we, I said, let's get out here, it's like quiet. So I was naturally looking for bits of quiet, even without thinking much yeah. about Kyle's video, because I, I can't hear myself think. No, for talk. sure. But that's also the interesting bit about that space. Yeah. And this space. Well, Bristol has a lot of green space. I mean, it's yeah. like London, but except I don't get the it sense that we feel it's as much under threat as it is in London. Oh, the green oh, I don't know. <laughs> really? Oh, God, yes. Yes. Yeah, but without doubt, the council really? are looking at every single green space as housing. Because well, we've know... got to put 32,000 houses into the city. And they're not necessarily going to put it on brownfield? No. Because... No. Well, you see. So maybe it is. That's a, that's a concept. From where, from where we yeah. are, yeah. it very much feels like every single green space is to be fought for. I'd fight for them. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of interested with the green spaces. A lot of them look like they're places to walk through rather than being places to use. And something like this one, for instance, um, is just a bit of cutting the grass and a few trees, isn't it? Which, as important as it is, I'd like to think that people who lived here really kind of thought quite strongly about this place. Can I tell you a secret? Yes. If you walk around, you'll find some gorilla planting. Ah, oh, gorilla dancing. Well, you see, I'm loving this already. Because we didn't know, when we came here, it was pouring with rain. Yeah. But we thought, this doesn't... It's a green space, it's beautiful. It is nice. But it didn't look like it was being used. I, and I just didn't know of this area to know what this space means. I think it's got to be about kind of ownership. You know, people who live here, I think, have got to kind of want yeah, it. Yeah, I, 
otherwise they sort of die, don't they? Because mm. I think gorilla kind of stuff is really interesting. Uh, and you know, sometimes you can kind of step forward and do things for other people, but if you don't want it or don't appreciate it or don't understand it, then it's a bit of a wasted effort. You know? So um, I think people have got to kind of own these places to make them really, really kind of viable. I'd agree with that. I think gorilla planting can be a, a start to reclaim ownership of the space, but it takes a certain kind of activist to do that. And I think what, what's needed is, you know, is for local people, if they do feel a bit more like it's theirs and, are, and, and some steps can be taken to encourage that kind of thing. So it becomes, so gorilla planting sounds a bit like, well, I'm not really allowed to do this, but I'll do it. But something that explicitly allows people to do it. Um, I think uh, the, the idea of permission is a really interesting yeah. one because um, sometimes you know if you wait for permission you never actually get anything but mm. if you take the initiative and do stuff then you sort of establish this sort of test that it works and nobody kind of seemed to mind and maybe that's the role then of kind of gorilla stuff is like it, it gives people permission to um, Nobody got hurt by that, you know. Well, worked. once something started was a bit more established, and there's a good example in the park just around the corner from me, which I think started as a bit of a guerrilla gardening thing, but it's now been sort of more formally designated as a community garden, and there are signs up there, uh, Dame Emily Park in, uh, in Southfield, uh, and, there are, and there are signs there that are now encouraging people to go and plant stuff and, and, and take things, take food as it. As it grows. That's interesting because it didn't start as a guerrilla garden. Well, no, I don't know how yeah, it started. Yeah, no, that is interesting because I'm very involved it felt, in that. It felt like yeah. that might be how it started. But. Most of the most of the traffic we come across is bicycle. Right. Um, so it's a good cycle route. It's not always that busy, and the roads are really massive, aren't they? Yeah. It's a good bus route. It's a good cycle route. If you're walking, you're probably not going to walk, are you? No. It's a it's a long way unless you're just living in Old Market. It's it's significant distance. My guess is you'd be either on the bus or on a bike. Well, I think that's what they're trying to do with, with some of the flat. They're all at that end, so yeah. they're really well connected with the city centre. And there's a, there's a sort of slew of space over here that's kind of been left. A bit of a disconnected. But typically, as elsewhere, as is so often the case, walking is underestimated, isn't it? As, both in terms of its social value, in terms of self police na what they call natural surveillance, creating life in a place, sustaining retail. Mm. But you wouldn't, you know, it would have to be a nice walk. It would yeah. have to be a pleasant. If you make, if you could make this really nice walk all the way down, then you might get a little share. What's the difference between ownership, wardship, and stewardship, and which one gives people more of a sense that they might still be able to improve something even though they do not own it? They might still legitimately feel that they have a permission. To improve it. I don't know about the difference in those words, but I think, yeah, the, the, there well, needs to be some. There's legal yeah, ownership. Yeah, yeah, I know there is legal that's, ownership, that's, but I, I don't yeah, think that's necessarily needed for people to feel ownership. Yeah. Yeah. They just need to feel somehow there needs to be some kind of visible yeah. statement that yeah. you can see if you do this, you're not you're not causing a problem yeah. or you're not doing something wrong. My, I don't know what your sense is of the year of 2015. Are these conversations a part of 2015? Definitely. Yeah. You think they are? Yeah. What, what, in what context are you in, in the context of 2015, should be setting, sowing the seeds of, of, of thinking for... Like, you said should be. Yeah, yeah, should be. <laughs> yeah, is it, I suppose? That's I don't know, is that your question? My question is, is it? And, and my... my it sounds like you're saying you're not aware of... My sense is it isn't. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know... I've not heard enough about it. Right. And I don't think a lot of smaller groups have heard enough about it to try and get involved. Mm. How will the city... I think almost by the end of the year, it's going to be, like, more... There's going to be more information and knowledge than at the beginning, a lot, hopefully. Right. It's actually done to better in the place you connect and actually get to mm. worse. Yeah, but I think that's... No, I think London that's where Pam's coming from, certainly, and her understanding of... The top Even down when the rest yeah. of the country is uh, the trickle down is going to take the next sort of five to ten years. This is because it's a big trickle down of the aspirations from okay. the green Okay. Okay. Another thing I was thinking is that this walk is very Bristol because we're out and about, we're walking, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm not quite sure that anywhere else you would have people out and about having their meeting and their discussion. So I think that is definitely something that's very Bristol and I know I've heard it talked about at various events. What do we have here, gardening expert? These are begonias. 
um, Japanese anemones, um, an awful lot of weeds, um, ligularia, and loads and loads of stinging nettles. And perovskia, which seems to be the council's most favourite thing. It's everywhere. Is that the long The long stemmed, one, stemmed with the blue on the end, yeah. Ah. So this is your gorilla bit? No. Oh, this, one, this was the council? No, this is the council, right. yes. I thought it didn't look terribly gorilla-esque no. to me. I wonder whether this space is, is used much. Yeah. Um, obviously it's really quiet today, but it's the summer holidays, so would you expect there to be more people here? Yeah, children. Even the, the sports equipment over in the distance over there. I'm assuming that looks like a, a, a basketball court. It doesn't look like anything's happening. And I don't know if it's in shot, but the mural on the wall, mm -hmm. um, this is another iconic kind of Bristol thing, is the street art and the use of you know, space. So walls aren't just left empty. Um, they're often used to display street art. And I think that's... And I completely love that. But then you've got the, the building just to the yeah. left of it, which is obviously someone's property. Just tagged. It's yeah. just been tagged. And it's the difference between the one and the other. And, you know, you allow someone to have that artistic space and then somebody will unfortunately either ruin it or ruin a nearby space just yeah. by putting a tag on it. And there's such a difference between them and people write off graffiti um, of, in all forms because of tags, I think. And I think that's a real shame because Bristol's actually got some fantastic art to offer that's just been you know, put on a wall and will disappear the following week. And I think that changing artwork is also something that's really really vibrant and sort of adds to the character of the city. But it all seems quite well kept, this, this nice green space. Yeah, lovely big old trees. Yeah. And uh, very litter free as well, which is nice. I think um, the green spaces in Bristol are quite well cared for, which is, which is lovely. <laughs> well maintained. Are you a guy? Maybe you've got to sometimes. Hello. What are we chatting about? Uh, gosh, we were actually talking about circus and the prevalence of circus in Bristol and saying it's very, un again, it's a very unusual kind of thing. Um, but that, I suppose there was Circa Media was linked to the launch of 2015, wasn't it? But I mean, you've got lots of engaged communities and lots of art stuff going on. I suppose it surprises me that you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is really cool that they have a basketball vet sort of pit table. Yeah, we were just saying it's a shame that it's not in use. Yeah. Um, considering it's the school holidays, there would be more children around, more use of the facilities, which is a shame because it seems like it's actually quite a nice, well, maybe not many people realise it, that's there, I'm not sure. I don't know how much the Green Castle is doing to help local people realise what is in their area under the themes of the Green Castle around this healthiness and stuff. So we were just saying that um, whenever anybody talks about local shopping streets they always bang on about North Street and Gloucester Road but almost never mention Stapleton Road and yet Stapleton Road is one of the most vibrant local shopping streets in the whole of Bristol and um, European Green Capital needs to do more to include those kind of uh, senses of localism as opposed to that kind of middle class sense of localism and green that uh, is predominated up till now. Mm. But then I would also say, you know, because there's one I in, in the same vein, actually East Street actually is quite good. If yeah. you can kind of get past the sort of betting shops and, yeah, uh, and the charity, and shop. the charity yeah, shops, yeah, yeah. actually there's some great butchers along there. Local some, butcher, yeah, yeah. Re yeah, you yeah. know, really good fruit and veg yeah. along there. Yeah, it's just up for me actually, so it's just downhill for me, you're right. Mm -hmm. I miss Millie's. Absolutely. It's actually <laughs> local. <Yeah. laughs> but it's really good that some spaces are left um, for wildflowers because um, it's great for little chaps like him. Yeah, you know, it's great having the green space, the lawn, but we need to make sure that there's lots of borders. Available. Okay.
scooty now. It's good to see people um, on bikes in the park, even though this chap seems to be having an issue, but <laughs> someone's helping him out very kind. There, there does seem to be quite a nice um, cycling community, actually. Um, I, I recently had a flat tyre and was, you know, people were more than happy to just, you know, help out, offer to, you know, bump it up, sort it out. And that's quite nice here. And it's like, you know, I, I'm assuming it stretches across more than just the cycling community, which is, is lovely. Um, yeah, nice and bike friendly. Is that the long step? In it for good. I think this is a key message because it's got to be more than just 2015. So I think that works really well. Um, I think as a key message. The issue is if people just see it on its own, like that, they know what it relates to. So we're engaged with a lot of the initiatives for the Bristol Green Capital, we know what it is. But if you didn't, and you saw that on the side of a bus, or, or would you really know what that meant? So that would be my theory. Yeah, I agree. Is there context to it? Yeah. But as I say, as a message that it's vital it goes beyond 2015. There's so many different things going on, and it's what is part of the Bristol Green Capital and what is this stuff that Bristol's just doing. And, yeah, it, do I anyway. and it doesn't necessarily matter that they don't always match up or they don't um, you know that one isn't part of the other yeah. because it just goes to show that Bristol is still doing lots of things regardless yes um, but yeah this is why they got the European Capital well indeed yeah <laughs> so this is a typical part of Bristol lots of uh, new building work or renovation work it's like happening in all parts of the city but it's good to see that it's happening in all parts of the city it's not just in one part that has the most money for another. I like the fact that they're always trying to make it more colourful as well. Colour. Yeah. Which, you know, use of colour in Bristol, it seems to, to fit in really well with, yeah. uh, with what we have. So I've just popped over to uh, see one, kind of two examples of graffiti around. So, you know, Bristol has come through this transition of talking from about tagging and graffiti from this kind of thing, which is part of the culture, but... Um, compare it to this, um, you know, the kind of high uh, quality street art that Bristol's now getting known for. So um, I'm sure there's a whole story there about uh, what, is, what is graffiti, what's street art, what's tagging, you know, um, should we should we be negative about one thing and positive about the other thing or well there's a whole heap of questions involved in how we regard street art versus tagging and graffiti <laughs> it's uh yeah it's all gone i mean even, even the graffiti has got has become gentrified hasn't it yeah. Yeah. And Nick had a lovely word, they're seagulls, people are just coming and dive in and consult. I thought, we don't want to be that. We're trying to be sensitive to who feels it. Yeah. Yeah. How do we make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one. Yeah, we're talking with the idea that people have a lot of absolutely no way on earth <laughs> think they're green or relate to the green capital. That's really interesting. A lot of this has come up a lot actually within the rest of the conversations in the 2015 office. And, and they mentioned a lot of things. <laughs> Right, so when Sarah said she was wanting to come from Incredible Edible, because Nick and I lived near, I used to live near Todmud in Sarah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, what a wondrous woman, because again, if the allotments of people that don't feel they're green might want to come along, and I hate yeah. to use this term of, well, maybe they just think they're normal people. No, 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 they do. <laughs> but, you know, so, and I, I don't mean that everyone else isn't normal, but you know what I mean. Yeah, they are yeah, like, yeah. we're just normal. Yeah. Um, I would love to know why. It doesn't resonate, yeah. or why, but they do. Yeah. I may have some answers different. to that. Fantastic. So we might have a group, but I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm at Bishopstead in the allotments. Okay, so I'm at Stapleton. But we don't need anyone from my allotment, with due respect. Because, no, but they're well 
probably need to we in. probably do need people from mine. Okay. And that's what I thought. Yeah. And I thought somewhere like Stapleton and also the one behind the prison up in um, Oh I don't you don't really? unlikely. No no but really, they have straw bale buildings, they yes, have they're, they're, just in, yeah, they, you know, they get it. They, you know, they know. So we don't yes. need those allotments. No, but we need <laughs> I, you need allotments in Bedminster and well, and, yeah, and, but and one of you the know the colleagues at Mr. Chamber Dean has got one of the and, yes. and that would just be so good to talk to them, even on their allotments. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Walk around the allotments, the allotments would be yeah. so nice, I yeah. thought. Yeah. So for me, people feel so passionate about their allotments. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, 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 I have to say, that, but... if you know, if somebody said to me, right, okay, you can only have one space left in Bristol, it would be my allotment. Yeah, yeah. and that's it, does. It, it. Yeah. That's and okay, it's because I have actually climbed I'll the tree for it this year. So, um, yours is probably a yes, bit special. Mine's probably just a little bit special. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's yeah. yeah get off, get off. My, it is that whole get off yeah. my land thing. It seems utterly ridiculous. To but say. Also, it brings people together because there's a couple of characters in our office who would otherwise have nothing in common. When they talk about their respective yeah. rooms, are, they're like so yeah. 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 Really, it's like really barriers. Yeah, no, it does, and it because I think the thing is. Is once you are kind of, and I hate using this phrase, but it's become one that I'm synonymous with. Once you are head down, arse up in the soil, you could be a doctor, you could be unemployed, you could have mental yeah. health problems, yeah. you could be anybody. Yeah. So, you know, we all turn up yeah. in our jeans and our wellies and our, and our yeah. sweatshirts, yeah. You, you know, both people cycle, no, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's that whole thing where actually it's a classless space. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fascinating. Well, that'll be an interesting yeah. one. It would really be good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. How many allotment sites are there then in Bristol? We've got 11,000 allotments in on, yeah, on, I don't know how many sites, okay. but there are a lot. Yeah. We are really heavy on allotments per capita. Compared to other cities. To other cities. And it is possible to get them. Yes, yeah, so all this, crazy this whole thing of, oh, you can't get an allotment in Bristol for love of money, you can as long as you don't actually have to have one at Ashley Down. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're prepared, as long as you're prepared to, to sort of, yeah. But I got one within three months of being here yeah. without trying to tick yeah. yeah. We're talking about. So, yeah, they are, you know, they are available. They aren't offering full size ones anymore, though. You, know, you get a half. Yeah. So that means there's more people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which yeah. is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that whole sort of sense of community with them is so important. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's as much about as it is for as growing food or anything else you might do. Yeah, so, you know. I wonder if it's just because people feel that it's manageable, it's achievable, you know, it's a smaller space, you know, it's not quite as overwhelming as if you just turned up to a park and felt that you had to you know, yeah. do something. Yeah. There's a lot of control, isn't there, in a, in a square. Yeah. Yeah. Do this here and do this and I can yeah. sort of get my head around. And people like to have their own space, don't they? Yeah. Maybe less of kind of discreet, boundaries. Yeah. And I think also it's very much about what is effectively an old British tradition. That actually people buy into that as much as they do yeah. Yeah. the growing of the food. And escape, because yes. obviously nowadays yeah. we're all looking for that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And, and you know, there's loads of people you meet people, I meet people over and over and over again, yeah. yeah. I've got a bit of mental health issue, I've got a bit of depression, I've got, you know. Lots of lots of people. I mean, I you know, ladies have had a postnatal depression, you know, and it just happens. And are people mostly growing food, or do you find there are people also there? There are a few people growing flowers. Yeah. Um, yeah generally. So that could link up really well with the kind of idea of this kind of community prescribing model. That oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, what, it should look, what it should look like is that you should be sent from your GP to a specific community place, like perhaps Trinity, mm -hmm. where they are they have specialised people who know how to deal with that, yeah. and that then there are an amount of allotments available for people who then go, oh, actually, this is really doing me some good, I want to take it to the next level. Yeah. Without doubt, that should be Like, suck it and see. Yeah. You've got to yes. try it, haven't you? Yes. It might not be. Yeah, yeah, some might people, not take everyone. One on no, and, and also, there's that whole thing that, you know, often the most obvious you know the, the, the person who turns up and is really green and really kind of you know you know says all of it actually goes actually I don't really like doing this. Yeah. Well, we might have an extra bird. <coughs>
stress yeah. of having to maintain Absolutely. things. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, coming along to that community thing where, where there is no stress and there is no ownership, so therefore there is no, you've got to come and do this every week. It could be a social, yeah. like you might make a friend. So is that happening, social prescribing around the allotments, or is that something you're trying to no, encourage? Something that we're really another another Bristol Presbyterian strategic yeah. arm, like Sarah's went to um, something called kitchen on prescription. Right, which is okay. Not quite the same. No, thing. They grow, so they're growing they're in the kitchens, or they're making they're, food. They're cooking. Yeah, yes. making more about you know if people had some chronic obesity. It's more yeah. about sending them on a recall course. But it's sort of yes. getting enough. And actually, if that proves to work, then I think that we can just pick up the model. And go right, okay, NHS. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the problem is getting doctors to agree to it. Yeah, yeah it's pretty it is, yeah. It's a finance issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We can't pay them, and drug companies can. It's yeah. really I know. I will, I'm trying to do some social prescribing in the area where I'm Okay. And uh, it just has, we're working with four GP surgeries and it just hasn't turned yeah. off. No, it's really and hard. it is true because they're, they're paid to write scripts. Yeah. It really feels uh, like that's the disconnect now. We don't know yeah. how to cook, yeah. and we don't know what we're eating. Yeah. And therefore, you know, we're going to keep getting faster and faster because yeah. it's now become about an education. Yeah. 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 It's convenient food because you don't really know what you're getting. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. 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 And our model of health is very much led by taking medication. Yeah. So you hope that there's a quick fix for everything, yeah. don't you? Exactly. Yeah, I was chatting to someone just the other day at work about what she wanted to do as well, etc, 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 about, oh, I'm going to try this diet or that diet. Well, you know, the bottom line is you need to do less and move more. You know, no, it's not. It's not. No, no, no. Yeah, it's within your own gift to do that. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a it's a challenge. And actually, you know, there is a direct correlation. There is a direct correlation between the size of people and how much food they have available. But you know, you've only got to walk down the road. Oh my god! Oh my god! Stop eating! Stop eating! Yeah. You know, and yet you can't buy enough. So here's a thought. In the middle of Green Capital Year, uh, the council has approved putting in digital advertising boards so that we can get even more advertising stuffed down our throats and on a daily basis. And use electricity. <laughs> electricity, all that sort of stuff. What it, wouldn't it have been a great thing to, instead of accepting digital uh, advertising, to have said we're going to take down a load of advertising boards? I mean, that's just, that's a community I saw. And yet, that's what, this graffiti is what people will complain about. They'll accept the advertising there and complain about the graffiti. In my view, it should be the other way around. So, Anna Lee was talking about funding and just saying funding for, because we were looking, we, you know, if you look at this nice little picture here, it's Clifton, right? And we are, here we are, like right just outside the centre of Bristol. It's not Clifton, it's not pretty, it's the centre bridge isn't here, but it's still Bristol. Um, do you see, I don't know, I don't know how much outreach goes on here, but Anna Lee's just saying that we were talking about kind of like getting kids involved in meaningful ways in projects and saying it takes a long time to do, you've got to build it up, you've got to kind of like, you know, kind of work with your audience, one-off stuff doesn't work, but all the funding is project-based. So how can you expect longevity and meaningful engagement if you're getting, you know, little chops, chop, 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 chop bits of funding for little things? Well, I mean, also as the, the service providers or the artists working in these things, you know, you don't get to develop your practice further because it's just project stuff. And we need to keep evolving to keep it rich as well. So it's constantly a challenge in that way as well. Okay, that was it. Now that's finished. What now? Um, There's a few of these yeah. in Bristol, which are really great. I mean, they were done before the Green Capital, but um, it's something that I really associate with Bristol. Is the home zones I really associate with Bristol. And what do they mean? Um, well, a lot of them have traffic calming things in place or seating or little bits of uh, green areas so that it's safer for children to play and um, traffic is slower and cyclists can get around it it's safer and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's quite a few around Bristol which... Well, the city itself is, you know, and I think 
and I think that's the sort of the kind of conversation I think that I think people have in Bristol and I'm you know I'm one of those kind of sort of home counties refugees as well you know <laughs> so you know it's it's a but you do kind of have a sort of sense that you move here and you like living here and then you go well, shit how's it how's the sort of what's the city going to yeah. kind of look like if they kind of shave 25 minutes off the journey into London yeah, what's the sort yeah. of city going to kind of you know how how would the city respond to that yeah because yeah. I come from you know my family are from London right. one thing I would always say about London is is every time you connect somewhere to London actually London gets better and the place you connect in actually gets, gets a bit worse, worse. yeah you know, London yeah. has just always survived as a kind of global hub. Yeah. It'll be even fun. when yeah. the rest of the country is going to the dogs yeah. for a reason. Yeah. And that's just because it's because because as a capital, what it does is it hoards and consolidates power. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I've got this. No, there's not one bit of me which feels glad that we're going to get 20 minutes closer to to London. No. No. Um, um, I have no need. I'd like to be 20 minutes closer to the beach, mm. not 20 minutes closer to London. But, um, yeah, it's good. Yeah. But I think, I think it's interesting there's a sort of appetite. What I suppose the point I'm making is I suppose there's an appetite to use 2015 to have conversations next year, which is, which is great because we really need to do that because you can't do everything in a year. And if we did, frankly, it would be a bit of a way, you know, well, what would happen? The whole point is to create a. Well, we struggle with the word, don't we? Not a legacy. Yes. Uh, yes. But this used to be worse, this river, didn't it? It used to have more trolleys, more litter. I remember that. So it has improved. And again, the colleagues in our office monitor the water quality. We're talking about podcasts. Podcasts. And how the being in a place like this reminds us that you know there's a green heart of a city, but there's a, a there's an actual human heart of a project. How do you capture the story? We're I mean, just talking about you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. How do you share what you do? You can write it down. You can capture it. You can record it. You can make a podcast out of it, which is what we do. I just overheard this is the dirtiest river that comes into Bristol. This is the dirtiest river, really. Just talking about Hello, the Froome Way. Oh, are you? Yeah. It's my favourite. One of my ready? Oh, that's no, I didn't want to stop you. No, no, I've already Go commented on that. Cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just wonder if we're all kind of, I don't want to move it too quickly, but you're mindful. I was moving into the idea of using a river as a natural sort of air conditioning unit for a city. Because it's actually open all the way through to the concrete. sink holes in there, it's smelling the sewage. Then. Yeah. But then they're designed to coat for sustainable homes every three, so they're really well insulated. And there's no shade in the This the The plan is to head down River Street because it actually does follow this green bit in the middle of the floor. The frooms the frooms underneath this. River Street. I love this. You know what that'd be irony? They've actually named the street over it and there is Brought it up. Other people said it's interesting on the edge space and how it's been cut up. But when I saw this, this is why I wanted to come. I don't know if it resonates with you guys though. Um, and what I really find fascinating about this is it's the river for him. <laughs> Yeah, where's it go? <laughs> and it goes all the way to St Augustine's Road. <laughs> and I thought... Meets the there, yeah. So, Broadmead is under it. Yeah. Is Cabot Circus under it? Yeah, it should be everything, because you don't see it again until you basically meet by Avon. Yeah, and I mean, where it comes from as well, we do quite a bit of work in Eastville. See, and I see so many people can help with yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> this is the dirtiest river that comes into Bristol as well. Um, yeah, so, and also if you go all the way to Snuff Bowls, have you been to Snuff Bowls? And you can go and, yeah, the quality of the water there, it's really nice and clean, they've done it really well. And then as you walk in, you get that infinity that slowly leers up on you very loudly. But the river just keep running, 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 and then you get those uh, barriers they've put in. I think they are very important because um, the whole of St. Werbergs would have been flooded if they hadn't been in there. But then you've got that skate park there as well, which is such a wonderful space, but it's totally not... It's being used, but it looks like crap. <laughs> Yeah, so that's quite interesting. But then the water goes under the river. But then there's a lot of rubbish that ends up there in the river as well. 
because again now you've got problems about ownership <laughs> so the highways actually manages the road the council actually manages the streets and then you've got the environmental agency that's supposed to do the river that comes into because it's still kind of on the way into the city but now the rubbish comes from down the road most of it but then it ends up in the street so then it flows into the river so whose responsibility is it because no one takes ownership of it but uh, and that's one of the big problems really that just anyway so now you're kind of looking at what type of barriers do you need to put in place and how can you actually use the infrastructure that's existing in the city people you know the actual mechanics mechanisms to actually change these things and connect people to their natural resources so. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, so, I mean, Carlton has some thinking on this, and we'll walk along that way in a moment, but I was saying what's really interesting, if you weren't in a car, well, if you are in a car, you wouldn't know so no. um, Not many people were walking, you wouldn't know, particularly if you wanting to protect rivers, you're just saying it's the dirtiest one, but it hasn't been. Covered over, how's that? So it's like, well, what happens when something's hidden? And I know someone who works at the Environment Agency, and he said, These things have a habit of popping up when you're not expecting them, which I love the idea that the force of the river is actually something that can, you know, come up in flood areas that we're not expecting. Now, I don't love that it floods areas, it's this idea that we think we've got rid of it because it's hidden. And I thought, you know, that's out of mind, most and all the history. I think they've changed it so many times. They've built over it and built over it and built over it. And the one thing that's kept solid and prominent has been the river. It's kept on running. For me, I had a real heart strength for this one. Uh, yeah, uh, without even knowing this neighbourhood. Yeah. <laughs> but you have yeah, I'm also very close, not, close link to this one. Yeah. Have you, this is interesting. If you go down there, uh, then <laughs> you get to a um, you get to an incredible square, which I think is really well designed. And there's a pub there called uh, what's it called? Griffin or something. And, uh, but it, it feels, yeah, well, the pub is old, but recently done up in the square is new. And uh, we sat out there the other day, and you really feel like you're somewhere like Spain, because there's actually one of the few public spaces, you know, so there were children playing late in the evening. You know, it really reminded me of being in Spain yeah. or somewhere. And there aren't that many... It's not that many like that. There's like... And especially not new ones. So I think all credit to, to the designers, really. I don't know who it was. So this was one of my favourite local finds. I've been working at UWE for three years and I've only just actually realised to my own detriment that by the time that, that by the time you're at Cabot Circus, you can actually get all the way to UWE without, without riding <laughs> on a road. Yeah. Save this fairly kind of quiet track here which meanders yeah. down for about a quarter of a mile. Then you join the Froome Way and then you can have then you can cut up through Eastville Park and across Stoke Park and it's just a fantastic cycling network and it's one of these things I think sometimes is that what we need to do some you know what we need to do in our busy lives and it's something that I've, I've learned learned over the last couple of years is, is actually when you're in Bristol just take the long route sometimes to get somewhere because really lovely bike ride that takes you along the whole length of the, well not the whole length of the Froome, but along the Froome River. Yeah, it, it's always amazing that if you just get out of your car and take the time to look over a, mm. a wall or a hedge or whatever and find, you know, okay, so half the Froome has been covered in concrete. Mm. You know, it's got the M32 over the top of it. But there are bits of the Froome, like this bit just here, that you just would not know existed um, unless you got out of your car and walked around a bit and had a look. And this then goes off down through the centre of town, doesn't it? And it rises in the harbour side. As I said, you can get pretty much you journey to Yui, which is probably a from here from Cabot Circus, you come through Champion Square, along here and you join this route, it's probably about five miles away from here, but you know, you can, you can actually spend, I think, probably, I reckon, 95% of it's off-road. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, and it just gives you a lovely journey yeah. and just a lovely yeah. sense of freedom, and you're safe. Yeah. Oh. So, oh. the world. I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> <laughs> 
think you're right. Which is an invasive species, and it kind of is so aggressive it outcompetes all the native uh, greenery along the riverbank. So then, when it all dies back in the winter, there's nothing to hold the river bank in place. So when you get higher river flows and heavy rain, a lot of the riverbank um, where it's soil based will be easily eroded. This causes lots of, lots of, it's causing massive problems around the country, but um, ironically, it's a, a favourite of bees. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, Bee we have to like replace well. it with something else that provides pollen and nectar. Yeah. yeah, it's getting the balance right between all the different aspects of nature, yeah. which, you know, is actually quite hard. And in a, even in a, you know, a city like this, or even smaller places, is very difficult, I can imagine, to keep on top of. So, yeah. and like you say, whose responsibility is it? Yeah. And I think that is a massive issue. It's, you know, ultimately it's everyone's, but also certain land is owned by certain people and realistically people can't just turn up and, and do what maybe needs to be done. But the people who own the land don't want to or don't have the time or the money to do it. So where do you go at that point? Yeah. And it is interesting, as someone was just saying, obviously we've built over this river and you know 180 degrees you can't even see it but it's providing um, it's providing a home for pigeons that are obviously nesting under there and if we hadn't built over it they wouldn't have that space so you know, it's the whole man and nature living together and muddling through spaces that you can use it's definitely out of sight out of mind as well because as you say, if you weren't on foot, you would not have even notice the space. Green doesn't just mean green. It doesn't have to be green to be green. Yeah. You know, it means it, yeah. It, it's quite interesting the way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting in the sense that it does mean something different to everyone. Yeah. And that's probably a positive thing yes. in some ways. But it is, it is really challenging to take people with you on that sort of journey. Yeah. Yeah. And sustainable living as it's well. Yeah, yeah, and actually, as, as yes. someone who needs to write, you know, words down, yes. for living, there is no, no, we haven't, we haven't nailed it in that sense. So you have you know, to like you know, turns a lot of people off. Yeah, it doesn't mean yeah. it, does it? No, it doesn't mean it. Or the association is straight away yeah. with, with green space. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and then equally sustainable living doesn't mean anything. No, to most finding people. the language is really tricky. Yeah, really tricky. And actually, the language that tends to work is this. Yeah, actually, oh, you know, that, that, that's what we found as pull people in, yeah. is, okay, so we can save you some money. Yeah. So, so they go, oh, could be so green can be economical as a, as a sort of way to get into people, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's quite an interesting one, because actually yeah. then, you know, you, yeah, you can say to people, you can't, you know, there's no way you can cook, there's no way you can completely be self-sustaining, but, you know, we can save you money, because if you if you grow what's expensive yeah. 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 and they're like oh yeah brilliant brilliant because we would never you know I love artichokes but I would never buy them in the shop because they're three pounds for a tiny little whatever you know that whole yeah. gets people thinking and then you yeah. can very easily lead them on to oh you know ventilating your house and yeah. it's just basic stuff it's closing, room, closing your curtains you know that yeah. kind of stuff that really helps people yeah so it's green could be save you some money yeah. green could help you feel a bit better yeah. So those kind of things yeah. around the what people will take on a very personal yeah. level. Mm. Yeah. And then the other thing we found is it's about if it's not for the individual, then it's got to be about your community. You know, what, okay. what people can't engage with is the idea of you know saving the planet. No. Yeah, so it's just far too much. Deal with the polar bears or the yeah. things. Can't, can't handle it. Too much responsibility. But yeah. Actually, your your yeah. little bit, your little plot. You know, so most yeah. people care about where they live. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and and their kids. If you you know yeah. if you get get one of yeah, and, and also there's that whole thing, you know, you, people go, oh, I can't afford organic. Yeah, right, okay, well, we're growing organically because it's A, because it's cheaper to do it, and B, it's better for your children. So that's the two oh, things. Oh, oh, okay, why is it better for our children? Well, because, you know, and that gently introduces that whole kind of thing about local. And, okay. yeah. and the other thing we've done is to focus quite a lot on actually getting the kids to sell. Yes, go through a school's book, because obviously they're pesky. They just get it. Yeah. Yeah. My son is only five, and when we talk about marine pollution, he's like, well, why don't we just ask everyone to stop drinking litter? Like, it's just so simple to him. He's like, really easy thing, packet of beans from Kenya. But, but Sarah, why are they growing in Kenya? Why are they growing in Kenya? That's mad, that's mad, that's mad, because we can grow them here. Mm. 
okay, don't tell me. Yeah. But you know, and, and that whole thing where they go home and go, Mum, this is mad, Mum, this is mad, Mum, why aren't we composting? You know, yeah. all that stuff. It's but in the end, parents yeah. just go, oh, anything for quiet yeah. life. Yeah. And then I just have to go, I'm really sorry. Because <laughs> they just get it, yeah, it's yeah. so logical. Yes. yes. Well, they don't, they don't see all the crap around it, do they? You know. So it's kind of ironic that we end up having streets called River Street because uh, presumably we've concreted over the river. Do you know what I really enjoyed about making this map? Is following the course of the river. Because it goes down here and then under it goes to Broad Street and it goes to something else. So uh, they've obviously kept. They've kept it as clear as possible. Yeah. So this is the rivers where that, that green bit is. So the river of parked cars. <laughs> oh no, yeah, but the walk that we've just done actually, from the Trinity Centre through to Edge Town here, it wouldn't take a lot to make it a much greener, more pleasant, attractive walk and a, and a good route for people into the centre of town. I wonder how many people use this as a route into yeah, town. I yeah, I don't know. Because we would, I mean, I think more people are like to use it on a bicycle because of the yeah. way it connects up with the cycle track. Yeah, I, I cycle down here every yeah. day. Um, and then you see it's quite a good route along the, along the river there to yeah, yeah. cycle. Because it's quiet, isn't it? There's no, no big traffic, at least, especially not next to the motorway. I think it's probably not so pleasant to walk along the river there because it feels a bit... I wouldn't feel safe walking down there outside of... Yeah. Outside of why, why would that be, though? Because um, yeah, it feels very enclosed. It doesn't feel like you have <laughs> escape route to anything. Right, OK, so there's lots... And no good, yeah, no good lines of sight. So. Have you felt on the route that we've taken so far that the, the route has been um, well... Observed. Is there any passive security that you feel safe about? Uh, I think it's difficult to tell when you're when you're walking with a group. I'm not sure I paid so much attention as, right. as if I was walking on my own. But that's an interesting point, though, isn't it? I mean, how do you encourage people to to use a space individually? Yeah, yeah. Living in the city, when they they would associate the green capital with health. I, I would argue possibly not. No. You know, I think I think as soon as you say green, people immediately just see. What do they see? I, I just think they see sort of food growing and not. I, I don't really think people. I don't know. I think people think trees. They they, they kind of do. They kind of just assume it means something to do with. Yeah, plants. Air quality and tree plants. And, yeah. Okay. And, and, and when you kind of say, well, actually, it's about transport and energy, they're really confused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and resources um, as well. That yes, that's, 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 that's a really kind of... Well, how is that, you know? So, yeah, we've, we've, had, we've spent quite a lot of the year sort of saying to people, actually... But I think we've walked, essentially, we've walked down the road. So, although it's not so much shared... Park, yeah. Well. Yeah. Because, like, I, mean, it's, I found it quite an interesting space, as I say, I come through every day, and there's, there's quite often kids playing football yeah. and ball games around here but uh, it's, yeah, it's good that it's being used like that but also they're having to jump out of the way every few minutes as cars and bikes come through yeah. so it's, it's kind of quite a, an uneasy shared space it kind of it, particularly that area over there it feels feels quite safe if you're playing ball in there and it feels like yeah it feels like you can do that without this this is one of my like favorite thresholds of this whole street actually yeah. um Champion Square and River Street. So, we've, if we've walked along River Street with a name to walking to the centre, it would have been nicer to walk down there. Yeah. See. But also, at the end of it is a is a car. So there's no real actual straight obvious route through. Yeah. Um, but actually, then where do we want to go shopping? So I think the shops fun us off over that way. And I do wonder if it was a planner with a sense of humour. Well, I think it was a, maybe it was just to remind you that the river is under here. We're going to call it River Street, I just because like don't want you to forget that it's there. Yeah. Let's hope so. I think it's reminding Actually, that's a very good point. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. This river would have been here. Well, been there all the time. Though. Yeah, and it's this side, isn't it? This all the new flats that have covered it over. Um, but I mean, I suppose the, the good thing is to see that 
it, they're still quite a bit of green. Yes, I was going to say they're quite young trees they've obviously planted when building these flats. And I think the other side is the Cabot multi-storey car park. It is. So, which, you know, considering how close we are into the city and the fact that we are by the multi-storey, it doesn't actually feel that no. built up or, no. you know, overbearing. It, you know, you've still got quite a substantial amount of green for being bang in the centre of the city. Yeah. I do like Bristol for that, is that when you look at a view in the distance, maybe towards the suspension bridge or quite a few of the views, it always does seem very green. There always does seem to be lots of trees and that kind of thing, whatever your vista is. And I do like that about Bristol. And I also, having just come back from London at the weekend, feels far less high rise and less claustrophobic because of, as a result. Like you can see a horizon in the distance, which I think is quite nice in the city, so it doesn't feel too... I think that is the benefit of, um, it's not a flat city. So, yeah. you know, you have got yeah. so many sort of hills and, and areas and it peaks and troughs. And so wherever you go, there is a different vista and it. it's quite yeah. nice in that fact. Whereas London is very flat and yeah. you are basically buried underneath it all. Yeah. Whereas here you can escape quite easily to sort of a more greener area and, and look down across the whole city, which is... Now I'm curious about that because my sons live in London. Okay. They choose to live there and they like the pace of it. And I haven't lived in a city for a very long time, so I moved to Bristol three years ago. I think it's how the people, as much as you're talking about the vista and the greenery, I've never lived in a city, though, that actually takes itself so casually. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the pace. Yeah. But I, I really think people actually are doing that in Bristol as much yeah. as the landscape does it. Yeah. And I have no idea how a whole city, and I don't think a whole city does it, obviously, that would be far too slapdash. But I love this idea that everyone seems to have that attitude of, no, we're not in London, we don't move at that pace, we yeah. move at our pace. That, that I love. Mm. Yeah. Well, our London colleague, Ryan, the other day was saying the exact same thing. He was just like, I couldn't live in Bristol, it's too slow. Yes. And I yeah. said the exact opposite, because yeah. to me, London is... It's just it's too much. There's too much going on. And I don't think it's just too busy for anyone to really stop and focus on anything. Uh, whereas I love Bristol because it is the way it is. And there's you know, an because energy about there's, it. Yeah, not and, that, and a community energy. Well, that, I can't think of the right word, but the, the kind of franticness mm. of London. Yeah. You know, is missing. But there's still energy and a lot yeah. going on. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and it does seem to be. I can't speak for Bedminster, but when you talk to different people, it does feel like that is something that either works or doesn't. I'm sure your colleagues say it doesn't, but it does feel like somehow 500,000 people are buying into that yeah, exactly. idea, which I, I find remarkable for a city. Yeah. I mean, there's, some, there's certainly something every night of the week that you can go through in Bristol, whether you pay for it, whether it's free, in most parts of Bristol, I would say. Mm, um, so I don't think you're lacking in stuff um, like but London, but you definitely don't have to deal with the underground, thank goodness. <laughs> and yeah, just, you can cycle. Um, there's a personable to quality about Bristol, I think, yeah. and that's because people don't have to do the kind of tube shutdown where you just don't interact with anyone. Else. You're right, yeah. So you know, people in Bristol tend to be a bit more open and a bit more friendly, and have that little bit more time maybe because they're not commuting for an hour on the tube yeah. each way to do things in the evening or to get involved in projects. Maybe that has something to do with it. I made the move last year. I'd done 10 years in London and loving Bristol for <laughs> what it offers in terms of that slightly less frenetic pace of life but the opportunity to do so much more with your time. What would you be like on that was I did a massive piece of work at my daughter's school. We did a whole composting week where we engaged the entire school from Tiddley's up to 12. We had boys making compost things. We had we had boys making compost bins that they could take home, you know, the whole thing. Um, and at the end of the week, off they to toodled and, you know, we had this great competition thing set up in school and the last afternoon we got the entire school together and said, you know, this is how you can do this at home. Never ever do that in your own child's school because I had parents coming at me for weeks going, what did you do that for? I don't want to be bloody composting. I don't want rats in my garden. I don't, yeah. Go home and speak to your children because they have all the answers to that. And, and do you lots know of, how many lots and up? lots of people started yeah. composting because their kids said, well, how can we not? Yeah. And did really, you know, I remember a friend of mine saying, well, I'm never going to be allowed to buy compost from the garden centre again, Sarah, thank you for that. <laughs> you know, but actually, yeah. why would you if you don't yeah. need to? If you create yeah. enough compost in your own garden yeah. to yeah. pop them. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, it does work. Pester power does work.
Yeah. And I, I mean, it works on the corporate level as well. I don't know if Sam's going to be at Sketching, but they um, had a thing where they'd yeah, gone. Sam and, was coming. Yeah, they'd yeah. spoken to Waitrose. Have they spoken to Waitrose? They'd spoken to Waitrose, and then and then they'd gone and spoken to a school in Henleys about what they're doing. And the kids from the school wrote to Waitrose and said, "Hello, Mr. Manager of Waitrose, why aren't you giving Skipton your food?" And now they are. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. But it is just because they don't see all the political no, it's just, stuff. Yeah, it's just it's just no, it's, yeah food. waste food. Let's feed people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, compost yeah. material. Let's not put it in the bin. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. pockets brilliant in Bristol where mm. these things are happening and yeah. taking root. But it feels like <coughs> sometimes quite a mountain to climb right. to, yeah. you know, it's still the preserves of the middle classes really. Yeah. 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 So it yeah. requires a certain base level of education to even get yeah. the, the concepts. Really. And also I think in Bristol it's so easy to constantly speak to the converted. Yes. And, and actually, you don't realise you're doing it, and then you kind of, you can, I can be halfway through a talk and be going, oh, God, I'm doing it again, you know. What well, you mean just that you, you're halfway through a talk and you realise you're talking in a way that you... Well, no, you're just like, talking to people who already get it, you know, they're already, you know, you know, they're already they're going, yeah, 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 and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah you know. It's um, hard to get across that. It really is. In lots of forums we find, yeah. you know, and it's great that those people yeah. feel so passionately that they want to engage on every level, but yeah. it's really hard to get across. That over there is quite new. Obviously, new development as part of Cabot Circus, yeah. and then this bit over here is uh, is much what probably 70s yeah. by the looks of things. I know the Salvation Army is at the back there as well, so right. that's where you get the ex convicts yeah. all like rehabilitated yeah. before they head off. We do some work with them as well, and so many of them just stuck in their rooms. Yeah. And where do they go from yeah. there? So there's that quality as well. Where, yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So much for. Um, I mean, look at those little balconies up there with the tight. You gr bravely put some some plants out on one of them, but the rest of them are pretty dreary spaces, yeah. aren't they? Um, it's honouring that kind of stuff, lifting it up and saying, "Hey, guys!" And I know the council is trying to do that as well, like with the green garden awards. Yeah. Pride in place. Yeah. But it would be genuinely quite difficult, wouldn't it, to brighten up. I mean, some, so there's another one there where someone's made some, a really good effort to put some hanging baskets out and stuff. But fair play, it's really hard to turn that into a, an oasis that is your home. Um, and then, and then um, so the bit of space that we put out in front of us that people could use is a car park. So, you know, yet again, we've turned over a load of our usable space to the power of the car because yeah. we think that's the most important aspect of our lives whereas imagine if this whole area was an actual garden that was to service all these flats yeah. instead of a car park imagine opening up the river again yeah uh, like uh, they did in china didn't they? they 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 there was one there where they completely opened it up and put cars down either oh, sides really? instead of yeah huge oh. river that they reopened I think one of the things about green spaces is that you expect to see a lot of grass. <laughs> yeah. Whereas yeah. there's a lot of paving around here, and I know grass needs looking after, but it's kind of restful to look at, isn't it? I think mm. you feel very differently about um, grass rather than just um, maintenance slabs. Maintenance free block paving. paving. So, is this a public space? Is that is that really the question? I, I thought it was a car park. I actually thought it was a car park for the, the the hotel or for. And I've never seen this building, which is stunning. I know. Um, is that a bar on the end there? Real ales and ciders. Yeah. I would say. That's never, a bar. never knew that was there. With a beer garden somewhere. I, I don't feel... know if that's this space out here. <laughs> yeah. We're we gonna get one over. And that is the problem. So we could yeah. get one over in this space. So it feels like that hotel has been plonked in front of all of this in a kind of look at me and forget everything behind me kind of way, which, you know, you know, I understand and I appreciate that you need new development, but I feel like it's in the, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. And I, I wonder whether this um, area in front has been put in to 
compensate for the fact that a, a large hotel and a big development of Cabot has been put in, but it's just a whole lot of grey. Which doesn't fit in at all to Bristol and actually what we've seen already. Yeah. And I think it is it because it's where it is, on the edges. Mm. Because we were saying, you know, this is an amazing green space. That's housing and residential. We suddenly have the Society of Friends, the Quaker meeting mm. houses over here. And then we have an amazing pub. It's an amazing space. And we're trying to do the twirl around about what are they placing all around this? So, so I was mystified, I have to say. Mm. Uh, benches are quite random. <laughs> Well, the thing is, they've put benches on a, a plinth over there, as if you're going to sit there and, and look at something. But there's nothing to look at. Well, yeah. you can maybe look at the trees, but well, I'm not sure that's the right angle. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it is, yeah. It doesn't invite me to sit there and eat my sandwiches, and there doesn't seem to be anywhere for, like, workers to then go and sit and use that space that you would usually see that would work for There's that. not enough benches, and there's no, like you say, greenery, you know, a few raised flower beds or something would add a bit of character to it. But given we are at lunchtime, yeah. at the peak of lunchtime, yeah. there are maybe five people here that aren't part of this group. Yeah. So did anyone even know that it exists? Because like you say, it's, it's, you know, it's a sheltered spot. People could come, there is a bench, they could sit, but there's nothing inviting here. Yeah. And the, green, the greenery that you can see ahead, it seems to continue around the other side of the building and has obviously been incorporated I think in the design of the hotel. But you know, going back to our earlier B conversation, ah. it's all just what looks like evergreen mm. leaves and no flowers. So it's probably we might have someone in the group, I don't know, who's maybe a bit more of a gardening expert. But um, you would have thought that they could make the space and the planting a little bit more. Um, wildlife friendly. Yeah. It looks like effortless planting. It's ever, yeah. like you say, it's evergreen. It's not main, you know, something that needs maintaining. And I think low maintenance, like you say, doesn't. It's not very nature friendly. Park installation, the Bristol Wales, and then it's so beautiful. But it's, I think it appeals to people on a sort of more consumer level than a lot of yeah. in a sea of plastic. Yeah, I can see the point you're making. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that stuff, but there were big infrastructure projects that you could see. If I'd been there, I yeah. would have put in some infrastructure projects. I would love to have seen. I mean, I think this year has been an amazing in terms of catalyst for conversations. Mm. But I haven't seen the infrastructure. Like, you know, I, I want to be able to use public transport. Which is okay, I'm fine. I'm just moving from London. But well, the only thing I can think about is they're talking about having the smart cart for the buses. Okay, yeah. so you get okay. Yeah. But that's someone. That's for someone else's bill, not. 2015, that might yes. have been happening anyway. Yeah. Um, contact I was using contact as cards in South Korea in 1997. And I was going from train to bus and paying with a card, like an Oyster card, in 1997. You were not buying tickets for the bus. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you're not buying this. You know, why is it taking so long? And even like just the just this really simple journey from Temple Meads to the city centre. How is that? How? How is that so hard? Um, the only thing about this space is nobody, re very, very few people stop in it. It's another one of those yeah, running but through. They do it that way. It's fantastic. Yes. But there are people, so you probably don't need people to stop in the park and here. No. But the park is well used by the school. Yeah, right. That's so good. Yeah, the school yeah. are often out playing football in the park, yeah, yeah. which is good. And the school is that oh, it's the one net over there, and I can never remember what it's called. No, I don't know. Not since the park. No. no. There is no word in there. There's nobody sitting on the benches. It's no. One o'clock in the afternoon. It's school holidays. Well, yeah. it's freezing cold. Yeah. It's the coldest summer on that debate. Yeah. Jim yeah. Radio had the big green and black debate. And they talk about, you know, does green capital, or does the whole green thing, connect yeah. with everyone yeah. because you have to admit that you have to be fairly comfortable where you are in order to have the margin to give a damn about the environment mm. you know you have to be you have to have space in life a bit of money or time to attend events or time to volunteer yeah. or time to read stuff or be connected to you know be uh, aware of stuff you know you have to be plugged in and if you're not plugged in what does the environment matter? The only thing that matters is, is your electricity on? Can you cook food? And is your neighbourhood safe? And can I, I don't know, I can't remember what the categories were for choosing this group, but we have a group of people who are a certain demographic here, and we don't have representation from, I think. Yeah, look around. Yeah. White people. As a South African, I notice those things. Mm. Yeah, and like the, the so the organisation. I mean, if you want meaningful engagement, you can't be one group of people telling another group of people what to do. Like that's just ridiculous. Like you just and you don't get. An... And that's that's a challenge. So what do we do next? Exactly. And actually, I think the proof of the pudding of the green capital will be in five years' time. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be 2015 at all. And I think communications around that have got to be letting people know that actually this is a long-term thing because I think. Just like the conversations that this has catalyzed are amazing, the people it's brought together are amazing, and we haven't got all the answers, so it shouldn't be seen as an endpoint. I think it should be seen as a start. Yeah, absolutely right. So yeah. And you look at where we are. We're surrounded by in, 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 a, in a place that's been recently regenerated. Um, it didn't look like this ten years ago <coughs> at all. No, it didn't. at all. That it didn't. So you know, there's obviously life in the old dog yet. <laughs> yeah. I like your optimism. Nice one. It's a Matthias Park. It's maybe a Frome Valley, you know. It's, yeah. Really? <laughs> this is where the river goes off yes. through there. It, I mean, it's just fantastic. Yeah. But, um, it's nice to give a sense of it in a way. But I just, you know, this, this is this space here. That could be a hole looking down into the river, couldn't it? Mm. And uh, make it like a, an urban well. Okay, you're not going to drink from it, but actually it's going to be cool and the smell of the river. To, yeah. Yeah. What's, what's there? Yeah. Because at the moment, the way that the road cuts this off from the rest of the city is just a blank facade with a few selected points yeah. through. And I think they're governed not so much by retail, but actually by highways and where they put the crossings. I think that's true. Mm. Yeah. Probably quite nice to live along here. Actually, it's been lovely. It's, um, it does. It does feel like one of these sort of spaces that's a little bit forgotten. Yeah. I'm guessing the bollards make it very obviously just for pedestrians and not not for people, uh, not for cars. 
this is certainly more of the older sort of footprint and urban pattern of yeah. West Street. Hold on to that thought because when we get back into the bigger group, I know Sarah from Incredible Edible. I was part of one of their conversations about the work they're doing. I'm sure she would love to have that conversation with you. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is you've got some buddlier growing out of the cracks in the uh, wall there. And that is a... Butterflies love it. I can't, can't tell it's safe for sure. Bees love it. I know butterflies yeah. do. It's a wildlife. And it's the kind of plant that just grows alongside railway tracks. And, you know what I mean? It's the kind of plant that kind of proves that nature will win, yeah. no matter how much concrete you put down. Or like, like you said, that's growing out of a wall. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, there, there is hope there. See this, uh, this is much nicer. Yeah, this property seems to have a green space. It's like you've walked out of a concrete sort of jungle into this actual green space that looks inviting, somewhere you'd want to be, you'd want to sit. What's this on that then? Actually, yeah. So we That almost space now looking back at it you almost feel it needs a fountain or something yeah, in the middle of it there's nothing to make you want to go there is there like you, say, you see you need something more natural you need water you yeah, need these plants these benches here you can imagine people sitting on yeah. those, those ones there yeah, yeah. It just yeah, it's not yeah. Bring yeah, it's a place that people walk through the corridor <laughs> but then here again it's still just green plants but at least someone's planted something <laughs> it's just such a contrast isn't it in the space so even even the the central area over there there's just um, some benches around um, it's, a concrete uh, area it's still prettier and more inviting than even though there's nothing in the centre and I don't know if it if it's just that we are so in tune to wanting to be in a green space I, I'm not sure why well, green been, areas seem to be so much more inviting to, to people than yeah. anything else. There's been some research recently, I don't know enough about it, but um, linking green space to well-being. Yes. And how that as humans we need green space and, you know, in order to function properly, especially mentally. So, yeah, I think that's why, you know, spaces like that are not good for us where there's lots of concrete whereas yeah. spaces it's like we're heading into this park yeah. and you know just having that little bit of green space away from the hustle and bustle apparently does wonders for our mental health yeah. and even uh, I think there's research even people who are in hospital who are looking out at a green view through their window or a picture of something green a tree uh, and staff looking out of their, their windows at work into green space can really help people stress levels keep um, actually help with creativity and problem solving as well, being able to look out a window at green space. So, um, yeah, more and more evidence we need to have that green space. And the thing is, is the more we remove ourselves from it, you know, by living in urban areas, the more you don't have a, you know, there's a problem with people being not interested in wildlife and nature and green space and the environment and climate change and it's because they're so far removed from it because they live in a concrete jungle whereas like you say most people benefit from a walk in the park so this is interesting it says in 1850 bristol's the most unhealthy city in England. and this was purposefully made in a movement to create new green space in Bristol to benefit healthy residents. So there we go. So Bristol's always been doing it. Exactly what we were saying. How are we enjoying ourselves? We are. Yeah? Um, what did you think of the transition from River Street to this street? Um, I actually really like this street. I think I really yeah. like the, the square then this street with these amazing yeah. huge trees. Well, the shared spot, I think the shared space is beautiful and it really makes a big difference in, in particularly in the evenings because this is our 
this is our Trinity local pub, which is really cool. And as I was sort of saying, I do you live around here? No, but I'm the chair of the Trinity Centre. How are you? See. So this is our pub. It's not my local, but it's the Trinity's local. Right, right, and right. The thing I think it's just such an achievement what the guy's done who runs it. Yeah. Because I was saying to Mark earlier, it is buffered in by a shopping centre and a really large Muslim community who obviously don't drink. Yeah, quite. Plus, on top of that, a kind of a gay village. Yeah, and yeah. Yet amongst that, what he's managed to do is create a really take over and create a really thriving sort of real ale and food pub. Okay. And I think just in an era where people are saying pubs don't work, pubs don't stack up, yeah, well, pubs are closing all the time. Actually, yeah. I think he's a model of just somebody who's quite achieved at creating a, a good buzz about the place. Hmm. That little doorway. Is going yeah. Well, this is this. Yeah, well, yeah, this is the old. This is, this is part of it. This is the old city wall running across. Uh, is that and right? And you can actually track it. I'm glad you came. Right the way up. Across, you can actually see parts of it. It gets a bit interspersed right up onto West Street, on, onto West Side. There's no, is there, there's no remainder of the gate in, is there? Uh, no, no, that's gone. But yeah. that, that used to be the old market. And when we get into the Trinity, we, if we can go upstairs into the exhibition space, we can go and see the, cool. the, the, the Vice and Virtue exhibition. Um, so that's another thing that I think is quite interesting that's quite interesting is this disconnect from soil. Yes. Okay. Do I, so why would I be interested in soil? But, you know, again, like losing that relationship. With... Yeah. And again, that's where kids are really important because actually you hear it over and over again where kids go, I'm not allowed to do that because I can't get dirty. Yeah. And so you go, okay, so where does your food come from then? Well, it comes from Tesco's. Okay, but where does it come from before it was... Anyway, you go back to the lorry and a factory and, you know, eventually you get to either, oh, maybe a farm, or you get to, I don't know. Um, and, you know, that's where your food comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Kids get that inherently. They go, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. What's the optimum age, Sarah, to get the visitor? Honestly, about three and a half, four. Really? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just to hope for one of mine. Then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think by seven or eight it's done. Well, there's, there was a piece of work done a few years ago that said whatever you were going to be passionate about, you, you, are, you, you are by the time you're seven. If it hasn't caught you by the time you're seven, forget about it. So whether, whether it's football or cycling or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no pressure there. Chocolate. There's a real shift in building types here. It is. Well, you're getting a lot more of these sort of flats and, and the mixture of social housing is quite strong. Right. So I think the opportunity really is, is to remain quite a kind of diverse area. Yeah. I think slowly but surely the kind of young professionals are moving into the area. It'd be nice to see a removal of some of these fences so the green space is more accessible. Because at the moment we just walk past the fence. Just, yeah. Does it keeping people in or stopping people getting in? And this is obviously this here. Show me a tag of this square here. Yeah. This is seven so ways. Just all isn't of it? the furniture removed from it seems a little bit odd. Yeah. You know, there's nowhere to cut. You know, given that we have this beautiful square down there, yeah. with lots of benches and kind of civic space. Yeah. And no. Um... Not, but not to have a. Re you know, not to have to have that as an experience right the way down. Look, you know, because you, you've got this one here. And we are actually cutting through the middle of the square, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, for the number of, of traffic that's using it, it's almost a shame for it to be set, two it separate islands, be, shouldn't it? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, this should be this, a road. This needs the Queen Square effect to yeah, get does. rid of the road down the middle and open it up as a bigger park. This is where's, where does the money come from? <laughs> is it a wood? Well, the bank, uh, of yeah. course. Or is it wood? No, um... <laughs> is that the Green Capital Fund? <laughs> yes, that, that magic Green Capital Fund, <laughs> the fund that keeps, <laughs> that keeps, keeps saying, giving. But it's, um, we keep talking about how, do, how can we invite people to come and meet with us instead of talking about how can we go and meet with other people. Yeah. And that's, I think, the fundamental difference and one of the little bits we learn through that different communities have different ways of... Um, uh, enacting what they do and therefore it's not about just inviting people in so it would be a bit weird for uh, uh, unless you were used to going for a walk uh, to, to come out I mean it's a bit weird anyway to say is, is in a business day let's have a meeting that's going for a walk so then when you add on the cultural differences and say oh by the way come it, it was probably never going to be the case unless you went and found a community leader in their community and said how best can I organize something with you that enables us to have a conversation and they probably would have turned around and said well let's have lunch 
or let's have some food, let's have some music, or they might have said something completely different. Let's come to one of our coffee houses, uh, come to one of our um, mosque conversations, come and meet the Imam, or come and all sorts of different things. So if we ask different questions, we'll get different answers. But I think it also goes to show that, I mean, that's what a Bristol, so this is a Bristol City Council Park, it says they maintain it and they look after it. That area over there that we were in has no ownership from what you can do. You don't know which what it belongs to and, and maybe that is another reason why it's a whole lot of blank space because you know whoever developed it, you know, if they're a developer they, they might not be a local developer, get they're gonna put in what's cheap and easy um, and what they just think is oh it's a convenient space. Yeah. And then off they go and then it's the locals that then realise what maybe they would want to do with it. But it's not their space, no one owns it, no one feels that they can take it over and mm. make it into a community space or do anything with it, yeah. which I think is different. The council seem to have a lot of green spaces, but they, you know, they, they encourage, there are lots of, you know, g uh, gardens and, and community areas within council-owned parks, and, they, you know, you get the impression that they encourage people to take ownership of the park. Mm which I think really helps in, in keeping it a nice area to be. So here's the volunteer tavern. I think there's um, a green organisation that meets here. Um, on the name of it. Anyway, it's a place for people who are involved in different green initiatives to meet up and um, get to know each other. I ran an equivalent somewhere where I used to before. And, um, yeah, but I don't know how many people know about it. Uh, it's not really... If you guys were both interested in green stuff, you probably have never heard of this thing that happens. It's not run by the Volunteer Tavern, but people, they meet It's here. a meeting place for yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's good to see that lots of people are whizzing past us on their bikes. A few more coming. Um, but there's no cycle paths or cycle lanes marked. Um, however, it does seem to be a pretty quiet street, but uh, maybe we should keep an eye out for <laughs> cycling facilities on our trip. Middle of the road where we would have been killed on any other part of the walk. We were wondering because what's going on. Because they've blocked it. They've blocked it. Yeah. So this bit of road is for much well, beer delivery. And also for Change to give happens. people there. Change happens as soon as you block off a through road. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's all you need to do to 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 completely. Uh, radically change, alter the way in which it's done. And Corn Street would be a classic. I mean, other cities you go to, they respect the fact that during the day, during the walking day, you need to be able to use the road. So they'll have those bollards that come up and down. Six o'clock in the evening, bollards comes up, completely change the space for the evening. It's a simple fix, and yet somehow Bristol's never seemed to have uh, adopted it. Because. Um, I'm sure a permanent fix like that, or even a semi-permanent fix like that, isn't appropriate for, for a lot of places. But at least we can make the transition. And the, that beautiful story about um, Times Square, where the mayor knew he was never going to get a permanent solution through, he said, well, tell you what, just for a weekend, let's try it. And they put this stuff out, and then they came to take it away on the Sunday. And everybody was like, no, 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 don't take that away. Don't take it away, and now it's permanent and it's because it experimented. Having said that, of course, we've tried Make Sunday Special, but I don't think people have got... Uh, enough of the infrastructure organisations have got behind it. So it's a few people trying to push for it. I wonder whether the next step would be to do it in places where there is a strong community who would say, this is what we want, as opposed to it being imposed upon them. Um, so there's a little classic uh, near me where there's a... Uh, the Jail Ferry Bridge has got a uh, barrier along it and there were a couple of slowdown barriers for walkers and cyclists and then a guy came along to fix the barriers and so took away these slowdown barriers and it made it far easier to use and at the end of the repair these barriers went back on and the community just went, why have you put those back? Well that's ruined it. Um, and the council said, well, we, it's not within our gift to take them away. Well, that's, hey, hang on a minute. So there was a uh, local person got a petition together and said, and it's this tiny little thing, these tiny little hmm. barriers, and got everybody online. And, and sure enough, all but about one person said, yeah, get rid of these stupid barriers. They slow it all down. And lo and behold, the barriers are gone and it's a happy place. Excellent. Um, one more of that. A tiny little example of how actually given 
the capacity to act and the ability to be uh, part of those decisions that they do they do but most of the time it's because they have no idea how to and uh, no coordinating function to be able to get it off the ground. In the middle of the road and we're going to ask 14 other people to do the same thing. And we suddenly don't think that's actually quite important, isn't it? That, that barrier means we're literally walking in the middle of the road without getting run over, which is amazing, um, considering almost all the other roads. <laughs> we couldn't have even thought about doing that. Um, so I think this taxi is probably going to want to... But again, we were talking about, well, how do you make these nice pedestrian spaces? Yeah. Um, and this almost like um, yeah. not planned. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't feel to me this is a planned space no. for pedestrian use. Just happens to be a quiet area, doesn't it? That they blocked off. Yeah. But is it being used? And we were wondering about that and mm. what time. But you point out it's lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. Should be busy. It should be busy. Here's a space that could be green, but again has just been bricked over. So although there's some lovely trees, they've gone for the low maintenance approach here and you've got to guess that this is linked to costs and you know the more that it's probably council space you know although we want all these green spaces how are we expecting for those to be paid for so um, the low maintenance approach is, is probably budget Depends how old these trees are as well, I can't really tell but I think they're also, are these London plane trees I think which help to absorb pollution in the air so it could be linked to when the park down there was put in place to help with health and well-being as much of a polluted city. It might be related to that. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to compare it to yeah. what was here 50, 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah that was quite cool. There's passion flowers. And raspberries and, and blackberries. blackberries. So wild blackberries, which I probably would never pick because they're right by roadside. No, size. exactly. You'd be worried um, about fumes. But yeah, really beautiful passion flowers over there. And this is just a really random derelict site where pedestrians can walk through or cyclists can go through there. Yeah, it's not a lot else going on. Mm. It's hard to see who owns that area. Probably the council, because they probably have to maintain the pathway. It's not very well maintained. But it's great to see how brambles have just come up anywhere. Mm -hmm. You can get fruit for them, but they're really hard to get out. I keep seeing a lot of buses with the uh, Bristol Green Capital, which is great, but I, it's, it's my own venting about buses, I imagine, but <laughs> if London have, Sorry. London have managed to um, uh, get buses that are a bit more eco-friendly, yes. and we have just liveried up buses with an eco-message and done nothing about them. No. And I don't like that. And I was stuck in traffic the other day. I was on a bus and I was stuck in traffic and it was just, it was so buffed everywhere and it was, it, it was smelly and it was horrible. And I just thought we were completely choking up the city. And, you know, I'm sat on this bus that's completely green, covered in green capital branding, like what we know. And I thought, fantastic. So what, and I know it's a cost and I know it's expensive and I know that they're private buses. It's not like transport to London. You know, we have to convince first buses or whoever to, to do, you know, to spend the money, which I just don't think they would. Uh, but I think it's a real shame that, you know, you've got these buses that are saying, well, you know, be green and chugging out petrol fumes. Yeah. Well, diesel fumes, which is not true. Yeah. And it's particularly bad if it's a cycling city, which Bristol is supposed to be. And the Velopost guy, they deliver posts by bicycle around the city, which is a very Bristol thing. They have it in Bath and Edinburgh as well. But they're awesome. That's helping to cut down some of this pollution in the air. But yeah, as a cyclist, going to sit stuck behind a bus is an absolute nightmare. Oh no, that one's gone now. Sorry. Being a, being a cyclist myself, I have often been stuck in the fumes. And it, it isn't pleasant. And, um, you know, you, it's just knowing where you can go in terms of getting out of the way of a bus and its fumes. It's just not very nice. Because usually uh, cyclists are forced to share space with buses. Mm. Which, uh, from a cyclist perspective, is really not very nice. They're yeah. massive, they're intimidating, and they trip out of you. So I really don't think it's the best use of space. And I, as, I, as far as I know it, there's been there's one bus which is, does the um, Bristol to Bath somewhere, uh, which is the the, um, the Pooh bus, as it's friendly yes. known. 
and I know I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. Why is there only one? Yeah. And you know, and I like I said, I understand these things are expensive, but you know, we've got the idea, we've clearly got the technology, it works. Spread it out, do it more. And I think there'll be a lot of support for it, like you say, with the cycling community and just you know, general, general Bristol population. Oh, yeah, I just want to say this place is so lovely. I've not been here. They love lovely, lovely vegan food, but mm. everything's done in plastic. Oh, no. I've got some work to do here with these people. Uh, yeah, I know, it's that. Anyway, yeah, okay, please. Say something, um, what, what you were saying, or we were just talking about, uh, basically, first of all, looking after yourself and how important that is and how tiring it gets to be basically to demand change from a consumer or from the everyday people on the street to do these things and change and change um, but then your systems still make it so hard for you to do that and then you just every time get you get to a brick wall or I mean even if you look at let's take it single-use plastics how difficult is it to actually cut that out of your life how dependent are we on oil how can we actually you know what can we actually do and yeah it comes down to policies everything comes down to policies and also not getting negative by doing this work yeah because that you get disheartened so you need to look after yourself so all of that energy into systems that isn't working how do you look after yourself who, who nurtures you yeah. and that's why you then say actually i need to just look after myself yeah. what i find really amusing a bit further down at the end of this high street there's there used to obviously be i suppose like a, a green space it's now called newtown which is at the beginning of the way the cycle trail goes off road completely from bristol There needs to be something different every five meters or so to interest them rather than just being sort of generic space. Um, and Bristol, I really enjoy walking around Bristol. I don't know what you guys think, but I love walking around Bristol because there's lots of interest. Yeah, it's remembering to on. look up, isn't it? Because a lot of them have been sort yeah. of, you know, there are shops on the ground floor where you actually look up and realise yeah, that above. what's above. And they're all different. And okay, it's not quite Amsterdam with the higgly piggly thing, but it, you know, it's interesting. And you kind of see the different eras of building that have been added on as the years have gone on. And I think, it, like you say, it's really interesting. I think also pointing out the sofa project, Bristol is really good at reuse projects. There's the um, wood reuse project, Collectico, all these different things. Um, and you can recycle all your old electrical equipment, all that kind of thing around Bristol, which I don't think that many cities have access to, which is really amazing. It's in people's mindsets much more here, I think. I think we're about to go past a place on the left here, mm. and there's another one over there. Right, maybe not. <laughs> but help uh, yourself. It's just a, you know convenient stop and stop. Bristol is a very walkable city. Um, you know, because of the size of it, um, you can you can walk around the city um, much more easily than you may think. I actually, on that note, I really think there should be more. Um, priority given to pedestrians or quite a lot of junctions around Bristol because if you're trying to encourage people to walk around more rather than drive with so many of the one-way systems and large crossing areas it can be a bit intimidating for people who are less mobile particularly so I think um, and like crossing like this for instance there's so many elements it's pretty scary to our kids yeah, you've got three or four different arms of the road you've got to cross. And that's quite a common theme. The Trinity Centre itself is a great example of reuse. Um, <laughs> because obviously this used to be a church um, and now it's being used as a community centre. So, you know, that's reuse in one shape or form. And uh, provides a great space for people to get together, and there's the garden, and uh, adds a sense of community to the area. 
And I, I think there are a lot more places in Bristol that could be utilised like this that are just sitting empty. Yeah. But it, it takes someone, I mean, there's obviously somebody that's taken this over, um, somebody's taken ownership of, you know, an abandoned church potentially and made it into something useful and good and community-based. And unfortunately, there aren't always enough of those people to make the most of all the space that you could find. Yeah, we were talking about kind of like um, communications as well and saying that like so much of the communications around the green movement and are about what can you do? How can you do more? And they put it on the consumer. They put it, I hate the word consumer, but they put it on the people themselves. Like, where's the pressure? Like, but we know, we know that we need to be pressuring big oil companies. We know we need to be pressuring, like, other companies to really systematically make change. I want to see more of that. Like, we've got initiatives like Go Green. Um, like, we've got these things in the city. And that's quite important. Some of these, I really think, are duplicates of stuff that already exists, exists on a global scale, and, you know, actually could be that, you know, with the addition of everyone in Bristol could make some meaningful change in a pyramid. But like equally, like there needs to be communications around like what's going well, so that people feel like as well as the sacrifices they're making, businesses are moving, governments moving. Like we've got to feel like it's not just us. Otherwise, we end up with people who are cynical because they think, well, I've I've made loads of changes, I've done lots of stuff, mm. but you know, but Shell mm. is still digging up the Niger Delta. Um, you know, kind of. Uh, Tesco's is still ripping off suppliers so why am I the one that's being asked to do more stuff and I think there needs to be appreciation of the system I think that's quite interesting because that's the thing as well as you start digging deeper in yourself and you become you know you internalize this work that's this is kind of the journey because I think my journey personally was also like oh okay you know you know if people can't if they can't even notice the litter lying around you know, how can you even start talking about sustainability? How can you even start discussing these things? So I was like, okay, let's talk. And then you get to a point where you're like, bugger it. I need to look after myself. You know, what am I doing to become more sustainable? And that's how you dig deeper, dig deeper. And then you realize, oh, can I actually grow my own food? Can I, what if, you know, things are going to happen, you know, whatever. We also don't want to look at the future. We need to live in the now. But there is this thing on us yeah. as odors. And what do you need to do? You need to prepare. So am I preparing while I'm trying to mm. do, is it my job? I think it's coming to that point. Actually, I need to look after myself. Mm, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, so I think for the next five years that we want is comms that show the progress and, yeah. uh, you know, actually a realisation that there's people working really, really, really hard on this yeah. stuff and, like, they need help. That's the whole thing, exactly. If you think this little bit and again it comes to the funding isn't it if it's mm. just project based so you look at all the work that's been done this year mm. all the little pl seeds that's been planted okay so that's kind of the experience that we've got as well like we've done and you've taken so much energy to put it forward and to reach these kids and to meet the targets and you really learn so much from it and then that's it we were talking about what happens next so we were yeah. saying we were saying that 2015 is like I don't see it as the end point it's the catalyst right yeah. you know you look at Liverpool if you if you that ambition I think was partially set during the capital of culture I mean I don't know loads about it so you know but like you know, we just walked down Old Market and we just walked past the sofa project and we just walked past like some of some amazing social enterprises and things like living in Bristol we, ha we do have a system that is different. There's a value set in Bristol that's different to living somewhere like London. We've got a bit more time because we're not spending an hour on the tube every time we want to move between places. And there's things like social enterprises and these wonderful projects that you can get involved with. And I just want to see those narratives told and I want to see help. I want to see those communities of people that are doing stuff differently recognised and supported. And I want some kind of like citywide narrative about like what why that's that's great yeah. it's and that that should be in my mind like you know it's that support and like how do you make bring that to the people of Bristol as well how do you make that relevant yeah interesting about the whole point of the green capital though is that it's it's a big event to raise kind of kind of the idea that there is a connection somewhere yeah so actually it isn't we shouldn't all be finished this year it should be the start of something massive exactly and like, is that what you're aiming for yeah that's what we were saying like, yeah. how do you, so, I, I don't like the word green as a communicator. Yeah. I don't like the word sustainability as a communicator because I yeah. work in marketing. But I think there's ways of like tying the environmental and the social together and making them really personally relevant. And that's what I want to see coming out. This yeah. is, yeah, we've talked about green. You've talked about the social issues in Bristol. How do you tie that, make it really relevant? I mean, what's the other word for green? Well, that's the next, that's the, the, the answer, the, not the answer necessarily, but that's the final question. Isn't it? That's yeah. what we need the feedback from the whole city about. Yeah, exactly.
Uh, coming to the Trinity Centre. Um, I think there's more information upstairs. We're going to go around the boards. Um, do you want to go up the lift or the stairs? It was a church until 1976. When, um, what's it called? Congregation But the venue downstairs is, is the sort of bigger yeah, venue. Yeah, seen that. This is more for theatre. And the graffiti room, I think, is more for sort of events. Really.